Hello! And welcome to another episode of Marriage on a Tightrope. I'm, I'm Alan. Dang it. And we're still... Who are you? I'm married. Are, are you? you? Are you married? To you. Mm, yeah. We did it. Guess what, everyone? Guess what? I know. I know. I tell know him, what it tell is. Him, tell them. We just dropped all of our kids off at school. Yes, we did. And now we have freedom for just a few hours. Listen... We respect everybody's choice and what they're going to be doing with their kids during this coronavirus season. It's crazy. It's weird. So don't... Well, you go ahead and judge us. We don't care. It's no, fine. I think everyone has a choice. And that's the greatest thing is lots of schools are offering hybrid and online options. And our kids literally begged us to go back. And so we're doing a trial week. They're only in school for a couple hours every day. Yeah. So we're going to do a trial, see how this week goes, and then um, and then who knows? We may move to online, we may move to hybrid, but for the next two hours, <laughs> <laughs> we do not have kids at home. And I was I was sad. I cried walking to school because oh, did you? I did because not so so not so much that I'm going to miss the kids. No, it was that you know you're always second guessing yourself if you had made the right decision and um you know worried about what their day will look like and but i was very encouraged when we got there i saw the teachers smiling under their masks you can tell their eye their eye creases you can tell that they're smiling right right you can but, still smile under yeah, a mask yes and and welcoming the kids back um interestingly enough uh, it was unusually small. I mean, there were not hardly any people there. The ones that were there were all of our neighbors and friends. So anyone who lived right here in this the neighborhood, I noticed, were the ones that were back at school. Right. And uh, our, for example, our first grader, his teacher said that they only have ten kids in the class. Right. With two extra on hybrid days. We're the first school district in Utah to go back. Well, St. George went back. They're just northern Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, St. George friends. We yeah, love them. We, love we are them. we are the first ones to go back and not with a hybrid model, but full time. Right. I mean, we're doing a shortened day um every day. But anyway, it was it was just nice to see like the kids had really small class sizes. I talked to the teachers. They were super excited that they had just, you know, ten to twelve kids in every class. Which that almost feels like private school, right? Class yeah. sizes. Yeah. But um, the other thing that I really appreciated is they were super upbeat and positive. And we received letters beforehand. And it makes such a difference when they are happy to be back and they want to see our kids back. So, Yeah, we hope it lasts. You know what often comes with back to school, Katie? Um, would it be a tender that is usually hard to discuss about back to school? It would be a tender. A tender is a more positive way of saying trigger, right? Uh, we, someone in our uh, workshop on a tightrope kind of made that comparison last night during our session and love that comparison. So a tender are these, these difficult changes of milestones or behavioral changes that you have to deal with in a mixed faith family or marriage. And back to school presents one of those, which is children's blessings or father's blessings and this to isn't, the children. This isn't everywhere. I mean, I know that this is kind of like a Utah Mormon thing. We there, did it in my family in California. But, okay, maybe Arizona, Utah, Idaho, California, Utah well, it, Mormon thing? Yeah, I, I, but I've never heard that. I don't know. I've, I've talked to a few people um, that said that that was never a thing in their family. And so interesting. So it's not it's not for everyone. Not everyone has to deal with this tender, but it is tender because you know, I think that blessings are well wishes. Yeah. Right? For a good year, give the kids the strength that they need to f- feel like they can do anything this year. Right. We don't feel like it has to be as traumatic as um, traumatic or dramatic? Both. We'll say <laughs> dramatic to conv- combine two of them. Uh, it doesn't have to be so traumatic. Uh, 
as as some of the other tenders are because of what you just said, Katie. It is a, a well wishing, and last year was our first year of kind of figuring out how to do this now, since I wasn't going to invoke the priesthood while doing it. And we did have an episode on this last year, but we handled it slightly different. And we know that not everybody has listened to all the episodes. So if you're listening to the current episodes, you don't have to go back. Uh, What we did last year was we all sat down as a family and we we had the chair in the middle like you usually do. We had each kid sit down and we just invited them to ask who or invited them to call on someone. Who do you want to say uh, a blessing or a prayer for you? for the the school year to start and we thought we were asking them we didn't specify you can pick mom or dad we just kind of opened it up and a few of our kids picked their siblings to do it and it was super super sweet and tender yeah it was it was it was good and so this year uh we wanted to do that but then katie you had an idea too yeah yeah i did so my idea was to write them a letter and i think letters are nice because It allows us to look back on the past and talk about the now and look forward to the future. So I sat down yesterday and wrote four letters to each of our children. And I just put it from both of us and talked about, you know, what qualities we've seen in them grow, what we love about them, um, some advice for the new year, especially we've got ninth grader down to first grader. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a pretty big span. And so we sat down and after dinner, we read those letters to them. Alan and I just took turns and it was a really good experience. I think they love hearing praise about who they are and where they're going and all their likes and dislikes. And it was really special. And so then after we talked about, um, read a letter to each of them, Um, you know, we would read a letter and then we would have them sit in a special chair and then we would have them pick someone to pray for them or pray over them. And, uh, it was neat because we had Alan's mom who was, who we have interviewed in the past was there with us. And my son Hayden asked grandma to pray over him. And it was a good, it was a good experience. And then, um, afterwards, you know, they had their Nacho Libre wrestling in the yeah. living room. <laughs> then we wrestled and I got beat up. It was great. So there's just an idea. If that's something that interests you, um, you could do it in conjunction with an actual blessing. And sometimes I think those can be triggering for, tendering. for the tendering. <laughs> Tendering for the person who's who's left, uh, if especially if they're their man and they're not performing the blessing, um, but also for the woman and even if their spouse is doing it, like they may feel sad, you know, in some sure. way that their spouse is giving a blessing to their child. So, however you decide to do it, there's no wrong way. Um, I think you know. I thought another fun idea would be that we gather pictures from the year and we do like a little slideshow and maybe read the letter while we watch the slideshow of, of the pictures. But anyway, ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. Embrace all of the emotions. You know, Katie, you just talked about it, that uh, both of you could potentially feel sadness that this is a tradition that has changed. Uh, if this is not a tradition, which apparently I'm learning, uh, I just thought everyone did it. No. You can just try to make it one and make it one in your own way. So embrace all of it. There's gonna It, it could be hard and beautiful at the same time. Uh, that's okay. That doesn't mean it was a failure if it was hard. Difficult doesn't mean failure. Difficult uh, can be success as well. It can be hard, but you can get through it and and learn new ways of doing things as a family. Right. And, you know, while compromising and deciding on how you're going to um, address this mile marker with your children, while that might be easier easier than, than you think, um, I think what's hard is the details of it, how to work through it. So just want to give you some encouragement and love and and good vibes your way that, that you can do it and you can reframe it in a way that makes sense for your family. Yeah. And this this topic of tenders that we're talking about is one of the six weeks that we do in our workshop 
And we do have another workshop starting in September. What's the start date again? September 22nd. September 22nd. That is a Tuesday is when it will begin. Registration is open now on Eventbrite. So you can go to Eventbrite and just type in workshop on a tightrope. The link is in the show notes here as well. We are a little over half full. So you can go there and, and reserve yourself a spot for that. It will be the last the last workshop uh, for this year. So we hope you are doing well. And if you need some encouragement or need some some group uh, time and some, some time with a professional and Natasha Helfer and want some time with us as well, we're amateur, but we're, we're semi-professional, you think? <laughs> we're subject matter experts to talk business <laughs> style. Uh, we would love to have you. So uh, we hope that, that you can join. If you don't need that, but you enjoy listening to the podcast and know that there are others that do need the help, we are still accepting scholarships for a workshop on a tightrope. So if that is interesting uh, for you and you would you would like to help other couples that need that financial support, you can Venmo us any amount at uh, Marriage on a Tightrope on Venmo. Just earmark that, put the note as scholarship, and, and we have a budget set aside for that so that we can help those that need it. And if you're one of those couples that needs it, reach out and let yeah, us know. Yeah, I was going to say, we do have some some money available. So if you do feel like you need it and um, you're going through a a time where it's just not um, financially possible, we've had some really amazing donors who stepped up and um, donated that money for you. So please, please send us an email or message and we will work with you because we don't want money to be a stumbling block for you and your marriage. That's just an extra thing, especially when you're going through this. One piece of advice I would say, unless you guys are pretty much on the same page as far as the effort that both of you want to put into this mixed faith marriage thing, surprising your spouse by signing up for the workshop, probably not the best idea. I would talk to them first and see like, this is what it is. This is what, what do you think? Would you like to do this together? We've had a few uh, couples, one spouse kind of sign up without the other one knowing. And When the intent behind that is, I think this would be really good, but they may say no if I ask, (laughs) that's usually not a good sign that it's going to go great. (laughs) So talk to your spouse about it. If they have any questions, you can email us as well. Let's get to the second topic of this podcast episode because we had a good friend of ours reach out on Facebook and asking if we had done a podcast on uh, particularly family ceilings in the temple. And this brought up a larger topic of another tender that, that you have to deal with is when milestones are forcing your hand, what do you do about it? Uh, when I say forcing your hand, what do you think that means, Katie? Because I mean a couple different things, but. Right. So when I think of forcing your hand, I think of milestones, um, family weddings, family baptisms or blessings, anything that you would be invited to participate in that you cannot because you have not told your family yet that you are um, either transitioned out of the church or that you're having doubts about the church right and you don't feel good about participating in those yeah so it could be forcing your hand here's a moment in time this date is is going to happen how do I handle it either in a what do I say to my family if I can't participate or I'm not comfortable participating and B, if they do know, and that's not part of the equation, what can I do or what should I do? I'm, I'm worried that it's going to be very difficult for me. What are some tips to, to get through that? I think let's handle that first. And we can use um, some of our experiences as, as an example because it isn't always comfortable, but you can lean into that discomfort as much as you're able to because sometimes it really is hard just to think ahead of time. So before I get into it, let's talk about temple ceilings in general. And maybe we can use your brother's ceiling last November um, in the Provo City Center Temple as as kind of an example of how we handled that. And again, this would be about two years into my faith transition. So it wasn't fresh, fresh, fresh. Uh, but let's, let's talk about that uh, a little bit. So, Katie? Yeah, so Alan um, wasn't going to come to the temple but so here's here's a question. Let's talk about this. Sure. Because I think that especially for the transitioner, sometimes you can feel that it's 
while the actual ceiling isn't about you, that you should be recognized for the hurt feelings that you have about right. not being able to participate. And to be fair, we have had a few ceilings that we've been invited to. And and Alan, with like his nephew's ceiling, it, it was particularly hard. You ex- You expressed to me, well, it's really hard that I have to stand outside. And I, as the believer, was like, well, that's the choice you made. You, you, when you decided to be out, you knew that you wouldn't be part of this. And I didn't have a lot of empathy for you. I was still mad at you for choosing that. <laughs> and that was in, was that summer of 2017 or, or 18, 18? 2018. Okay. Yeah. And I, I was, um, I was mad at you and I just did not understand why this would be painful you for, well, painful for you to not be able to go in. Yeah. And to me, I thought, well, that was your choice. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't do both. Right. Has that changed? Like what, what have your feelings on that subject changed? Yeah, it's changed. At first, I think I was just mad. I was mm-hmm. just plain mad. And and now um, when you, he couldn't go to my brother's, I, it was, I was in an acceptance phase. Right. And I knew that that wasn't something possible for you. And I wished you could be there with me. But it wasn't like because of anger or fear. It was because I was just sad that you couldn't be a part of it. But uh, let me ask you, though, uh, as a transitioner, how do you get past some of those feelings of, you know, this is what I chose and no one is no one is acknowledging my pain here because I didn't acknowledge your pain when we went to your nephew's um, wedding. So how do you... How do you get through those feelings? Well, I think the first thing I would say is you can't skip them. Some people, people have different emotional resilience, I guess you could say. And there may be some people that are just like, yeah, I'm done. And it just doesn't hurt. But I I think the normal average everyday experience for those that have gone through this is you do go through that pain. The first ceiling that you sit out of or the first circle you don't stand in is going to be really hard. And it was for me as well. So the, the number one thing I would say is maybe not a, a very optimistic thing to say, but it's the realistic thing to say that you're not going to be skipping those feelings. It is going to be difficult. And in order to get past it, you have to go through them. You have to have the uncomfortable conversations to, to get to the better conversations. So that would be the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, um, don't put so much pressure on yourself to do it right the first time. Uh, deliberately make the decision of this is what I think I can do and this is how I can make this day not about me, but also understand and accept that it's going to be difficult. So with your brothers and even my cousins, or excuse me, my nephew's wedding a few years earlier that we just talked about, I didn't want, even though I knew it was going to be difficult in both instances, I didn't want it to be about me. And so ahead of time, I thought, what can I do um, to make this a little better? And so one thing I did with both instances is I text your brother and I text my nephew a few days beforehand. It may have been the morning of, I don't really remember, but I text them. Uh, I want you to, I want you to know that we're so excited. I am so excited for you guys. This is a huge day. It's great. Uh, as you may or may not know, I won't be in the temple with you. That is no indication of, of my love or lack of love or whatever you want to say uh, to you. I, I, I don't want this day to be about me. It's about you guys. I'm going to be there to support you in every way. And this is how I'm going to do it. So for both of them, it was I'm going to set up the reception hard. I'm, re- I'm going to do everything I can to help help the reception go well. I know that some people, uh, I felt comfortable, uh, even, especially at your brother's ceiling, to be at the temple but outside. It was harder at, at my nephew's because it was early on and it was my family, right? Those two aspects made it a little harder. Uh, even though at my nephew's, there were other of my siblings that were also outside of the temple, it still was hard. So if someone feels like they absolutely cannot be at the temple or cannot be at this at the baby blessing or cannot be at the baptism because it is painful. I mean it is injuring to them. What can they do instead? 
The great question. So first of all, I would still recommend if you are out to your family, if you have told them where you're at spiritually, uh, I would still send that text or still make that phone call or still tell them at the family dinner. Just say, I want this to be a great experience for you. It's going, it's very hard for me. I don't feel like I can be there personally. I'll be at the luncheon afterwards. Or if you can't do that, just be open and honest with it. Uh, we'll talk about some, some strategies. If you haven't been out, uh, we feel very strongly that your story is your story. And with ever, with whatever you're comfortable with, uh, you have the right to, to explain your absence any way that you need to, uh, including pretending to be sick, <laughs> so, but we can get there. Um, I guess you do have COVID as an excuse. That's true. I've got a, I've got a cough or all the masks are out of stock or anything like that. Okay. That's so what I'm hearing you say is, um, here are your, here are the tips that you've given so far. One, go through the grief cycle. That's something that I talked about mm -hmm. in um, self-care. So you, you need to fill those feelings. The second thing that you talked about is don't make it about you. If it's if it's a uh, event for someone else, make it about them. So don't make it about you. And the third thing is, is find a way you can be supportive uh, that you feel comfortable with. Yeah. So you talked about sending a text or being outside the temple and watching the, all the kids, or um, if you can't physically be there, um, just well wishes maybe to whoever um, is the event is going on for. Yeah, absolutely. Would, would that be a, good, a fair summary? Yeah, that would be a fair summary. If, if you're recognizing that you're early on in this grief cycle and it's going to be really difficult, I would also recommend asking what others' expectations are for you. Especially with a temple blessing uh, or a temple ceiling, I, I think that some people are they they get annoyed or they get angry that it's like everyone knows I'm not going to be there, and that the expectation has been set that I'm going to be watching all the kids outside of the temple. That's annoying, and maybe that's part of your support. Like I can support all of this by watching the nieces and nephews outside of the temple, and that's what I can do. So that can be a really um, <laughs> two sides of a coin. Some people are really upset by that. Other people at your brother's wedding, I was totally fine with watching all the kids. Nobody really, I mean, I just, I think I offered that up of just like, I'm totally fine watching the kids. And so that expectation was set on my side. But if that expectation hasn't been set, uh, ask, ask, ask all the parents, ask your brothers and sisters, ask your in-laws. Um, and if you don't feel like you're in a position to do that, just make that clear. You don't have to apologize for for that. Just say, I, I want to support how I can. I'm having a hard time. Be open about it. Be direct about it. And I, we're not, Katie and I are not ignorant to the fact that those conversations are, are easy. They're not easy. They are difficult. I totally avoid them. Katie avoids them. I, I don't. But that's just a personality thing. And uh, when you don't avoid them, you, you lean into what could be a very difficult response. You lean into the possibility that they come back to you and say, try to get you to, to come. It's not too late. Go talk to your bishop. You need to repent. Like you, you need to, I, I think one of the tips would be anticipate what the response may be. Prepare for the worst, hope for the best. Right. And I think that I like what you said about setting expectations, because if those expectations are set, then there's no surprise on either side, Yeah, which is uh, absolutely helpful. So those are really good tips for those of you who are already out, um, you know, set those expectations, those boundaries that you need in order for you to feel um, like you can participate in, at whatever level it is. So what if they're not out? I think we need to address that, right? Yes. I mean, we've talked, we've teased about it a little bit, but what would change in what we just said? You, you can't set some expectations because then you're outing yourself. If you're not ready to be out and you have these deadlines coming up, the, the harsh reality is that, uh, your, your options now are very limited on, on what to do. If you still have a temple recommend, you can ask yourself, and especially in a mixed faith marriage, talk to your spouse and say, look, <laughs> I've weighed the options and 
I either have to lie or if these are the options you feel, or I have to participate in something I no longer believe in and ask, don't ask permission from your spouse. We don't want to ask permission, but do talk about their level of comfort with you, with you participating, right? I'm happy. I'm fine to baptize our daughter, but I want to make sure that that doesn't make Katie uncomfortable. And just because it may make Katie uncomfortable doesn't mean that I don't do it, but we at least have that conversation. So the very last time that Alan, you went to the temple with me was at my cousin's ceiling, wedding ceiling. Yeah. And we weren't ready for Alan to out himself and we weren't really sure where things were headed, mm-hmm. right? Like you had decided in your mind that you were out, but I... The belief had changed, the belief but had the, changed. the engagement and participation in the church was still in flux. This is before the podcast even started. Right. And so we went to her um, ceiling and I remember us going... Again, at Provo City Temple, we went down to sort of like the waiting area and Alan and I were chatting about it. And and I said, well, what did you think? Because I thought it was a really nice ceiling. And he said, I don't want to tell you what I think. And I said, okay, well, what does that mean? And so I pressed him harder and harder. And then he did tell me what he thought. And then it was the rest of the day was a pretty miserable day Mm -hmm. uh, because it was really hard for me to listen to. It was hard for me to hear. He, at the the time, still felt okay going to a ceiling. uh, But then after, that was the last time he ever went to the temple. Yeah. uh, Because I, I don't know if it pushed you over the edge or it just confirmed that you didn't feel good about it, but that was that was really hard for me. Yeah. And and here here's the thing. To me, it does not feel dishonest if someone decides to go because they don't want to out themselves. Mm-hmm. And now this could mean a couple of things. If you have to put garments back on because you're going to a family event and you know that family will be looking to see if you have garments on. And you don't want to out yourself. That is absolutely your right. If you have a current temple recommend and you go to the temple because you don't want to out yourself, that is your right. Only you can decide how you're going to feel about it. And it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. I mean, you can talk to your spouse about it, but I I really think it's, it's up to you. And, um, I don't, uh, if now what happens if you don't have a temple, a current temple recommend, Yeah, I mean, then you have a choice to make, right? If you can't get it, if maybe you're open to your bishop, but not your family, and you know that you're not going to get that recommend or not get approval to participate in an ordinance, then you have a decision to make. Is this the moment now that you have to be out, that you're going to be talking to your family? This happened with us when I felt I no longer could go to church. And we had to tell the kids. That pushed us to tell our older two kids that dad's not going to be coming to church anymore. And this is why we honestly, we weren't quite ready in the respect that Katie and I weren't both okay with this happening. It was a hard moment. It ended up being a lot better than we expected because the kids were just kind of shrug their shoulders and went, okay. So in the end, it ended up easier, but for us, it did push us to, it did push us to have to tell them. So if you're in that case, it could be a good thing if, if you're, I'll, I'll say, semi-ready, if this is pushing you over the edge to do something that you've been avoiding doing, uh, if you're not ready to tell him, what do you do? We have a family member who didn't, didn't show up at my brother's um, wedding, and there was no explanation. Yeah, he just didn't, this person didn't say anything. Yeah, and I think that that was very hurtful. Very hurtful to the family. Right. Uh, because there was no explanation. No one talked about it. They just didn't show up. And then we were all kind of waiting around. And it, and then we're clued in that he wasn't coming. Do you, do you feel like that is, that's for him to decide, though? Do you feel like if he... Is that a viable option, I guess I'm asking? Is that if you don't feel like you want to explain anything... I mean, should he at at least, or should someone in this situation at least tell him, I'd rather not talk about it, but I'm not going to be in the temple. Yeah. I mean, 
Any give heads them a up, warning. any warning would have been better than nothing. So that in the room, while the ceiling is about to take place, people aren't wondering, like, what is going on? Right. Or, I mean, I can think of, like, instances, like, at a baptism where everyone just kind of gets, you know, waved over to come up and you shake your head. No. I mean, that's happened with a number of our listeners. They just shake their head, like, no, I'm not participating in that. And the biggest complaint is there should have been communication. So if you are the person transitioning, it is your job to communicate what your what you will be doing, right? What that expectation is, like Alan says. Um, it, it, and it could be as simple as, I, I'm not going to be standing up in the circle today, but I will be there to support you. And I don't really want to talk about it. Um, but... And that alerts, you know, that raises that the alarm, alert. of course. Uh, we've we've had people lie. We've had people say, uh, I'm sick. I mean, COVID is a pretty good excuse right now. We've also had people plan trips. And again, that's more difficult with, with the current pandemic. But we've had people, uh, we've done that. We've, we've gotten away absolutely. for general conference, as an example. Sure. We, we didn't want to be around for it. So we planned a trip around that date on purpose. So... If it's a, I mean, it matters how, if it's a cousin, maybe that's an acceptable reason to, to miss it is, oh, shoot, we have a trip that we've planned. If it's a sibling, maybe not. Okay, so <laughs> this, these are the things that we're telling people who do not want to out themselves yet is, yes. is that they just go ahead and do the ritual or wear the garment or do whatever they need to do in order just to get through it. Mm -hmm. You know, if they have an active temple recommend, if they want to stand in the circle, um, you absolutely can look at it as you are supporting a family member. If that's what you want to do and you feel good about that, that's one way. Um, the next way is to communicate that you will not be participating and, and just say you would not like to give them a reason. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that I think that here, though, you have to communicate. If it is someone close to you, you have to communicate it um, through text. Don't shock them. Do not shock them because um, then, then then the day does become about you. Yeah. Excuse then me. it <clears throat> does it does become about you. And then um, the third is that it does force your hand, and you go ahead and take the leap and letting your family right. work, know where you're at. Those are really your three options. Yeah. I mean, that you have three and, or four and five would be uh, you lie. I mean, it is an option. Yeah. yeah. You, you you decide that you feel better about being dishonest to preserve your, your, your to, to own your own narrative, we'll say. And then five would be you plan something else that you, quote, can't get out of. So sorry, I'm not going to be there. Uh, that's not a lie. You're, you're just getting away from it. Those are some of the options. If you have other options, please let us know. But those are some of the options. Honestly, we don't think that there is any one of those is better than the others. Every situation is different. So don't feel like if you choose one over the other, uh, if you decide to participate, great. That worked for you. And guess what? Maybe it won't work for you. That's what happened in this. Uh, the last time I was in the temple is I thought it would be decent and it would be okay. It wasn't monumental and I didn't fly off the handle or anything, but it wasn't a great experience and it convinced me the temple is no longer part of my experience. And it also ended up not being a good experience for me either. Yeah, and that's something so, that we've kind of neglected in this episode right. is that please involve your spouse in all of this because guess what? They're going through it too. And as a less willing partner... You're the one that is the PM, the the transitioner, the post Mormon or transitioner is the one that is that is. I know that you're not choosing for this to happen to you, but it's happening to you. Your spouse is kind of being pulled into it as an unwilling participant. So please involve them in all these conversations. We know that's difficult, but their feelings and how they respect and want you to participate and want to participate themselves, especially with the temple. The temple is a is a couple's experience. And that's the temple's been hard. Those moments have been hard where you've gone in with everyone in your family, but I'm not there. It's a difficult thing. So your feelings on this are really important. Yeah, I want to talk to the 
active believing members because um, as difficult as this time can be for your spouse, the transitioner, it is just as difficult for you, the one who is supporting your spouse and or the one who is having to deal with these milestones alone. And I mean, I'm, I can tell you that there were, they, I've been to the temple where I just pretty much cried through the whole the whole time because I felt very lonely. I felt very sad. I'm still grieving and mourning the way that we used to um, we used to worship together and things are fresh and raw and and it's it's difficult to be in that place alone. And while I've come now to a place of acceptance, that doesn't mean that I'm still not feeling kind of sad when things come up and Alan isn't involved with them. And so I would say that um, it participate at the level that you you feel comfortable as well. If you don't feel like going to the temple with everyone is going to help you, if you feel like you'll just be very upset and sad the whole time, then that's your right to choose not to go. And maybe that forces your hand. Um, maybe that maybe you just have to explain that you aren't feeling well, whatever it might be. I think that some of the advice that we've given for the PM can also be used for the yeah. ABM. Yeah. Really, Absolutely. honestly. But, um, you know, while all the focus can be on your spouse, you still need that self care. You still need to have those boundaries. You still need to take care of you. And um, we don't want you to feel like you're left out either. Absolutely. We love you guys. We know that a lot of these things are very difficult, but you can get through it. It's through the difficult parts of a mixed faith family and mixed faith marriage that the victories come. So don't get discouraged when things are hard. You have to go through the hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Is that a flowery enough way to end the end the episode? Sounds like one of us is dying. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go towards the light. It's not over yet. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this episode of Marriage in a Tightrope. We will be back with you very soon. Have a pleasant day and happy back to school, everybody. Stars.